78. If you've got the Word of God with you this morning, get it open to Psalm 78. That's where we're going to dive in today. Let me see if I can start with some amens. That's always a good way to start a message, isn't it? Get some amens uh, from everybody. Amen. Well, there you go. Y'all are practiced up. Uh, let, me, let me see if anybody can agree with this. Uh, being a mom is hard. And now half of y'all who said amen have no idea. Uh, you just maybe have some idea, but not, not really an idea. It's like me. I don't, I don't really have an idea. I know that's a true statement. I know I wouldn't want to be a mom. <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, that's too much work. It's too hard. It's hard being a mom. I told Abby, my wife, I said, hey, babe, it's Mother's Day. Don't you worry about dinner tonight. I got dinner covered. I'm going to cook dinner. I'm going to clean up. You're just going to be able to sit back and relax. I said, only if the fast food restaurants are open. <laughs> but, you know, came with a little bit of a caveat. Dad's got dinner as long as we can go out to eat. Man, it's a lot of work being a mom. Um, this lady named Angela Akers once said, Motherhood is full of frustrations and challenges. Amen. <laughs> But eventually, they all move out. <laughs> so uh, that was her take on it. Uh, I would say eventually most of them move out. I'm not moving out. I know I got a good thing going, and uh, I'm staying around. So. But eventually, most of them do move out, and that's a, that's a good thing. I want to start this morning by, by saying um, something that shouldn't need to be said, but I think it does need to be said, just because of the nature of today's sermon and something that, that I want to be perfectly Clear, and I know this is going to probably surprise many of you. It's probably be a one of the biggest revelations of your life. Uh, I am not a perfect parent, <laughs> and let me let me follow that up with this: my kids are not perfect kids. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how we can be better parents and better grandparents to raise better kids on Mother's Day. But I just wanted to be very, very clear because it can come across, um, I was thinking about it this week as this message was coming together, it can come across like I have all the answers, that my kids are perfect and my family's perfect and, 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 and I'm going to even try to remind you throughout this, like this isn't easy even for our families. I get being a mom or being a dad, being a grandma, being a grandpa, uh, it's tough. It's not, it's not easy for any of us. It's, it's much easier to preach about it than it is to actually practice it or to practice what you preach. So I just want to very clearly and very plainly say right up here at the top, I'm a struggling parent just like you, okay? My kids are struggling through all the same stuff your kids are struggling through, and we're working through that together as a family. And um, I, I just think it's important for you to understand that I'm not coming from a place of preaching to you today, but I'm coming from a place of, of being a dad and, and, and being a family just like you're a dad or a mom or a family um, or a grandma or a grandpa. So let's look at Psalm 78 together, 1 through 8. The text says, My people hear my instruction. Listen to the words from my mouth. In other words, this is important stuff. I will declare wise sayings, I will speak mysteries from the past, things we have heard and known that our ancestors have passed down to us. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell a future generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might and the wondrous works he has performed. He established a testimony in Jacob and set up a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children, so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know. They were to raise and tell their children, so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. Then they would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not loyal and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Inside these eight verses, the psalmist builds a system that I believe can apply to all parents, and not just moms and dads, but grandmas and grandpas too. 
Grandma and Grandpa, I, I want you to know, and you probably already know this, your job is not done when your kids leave the house. They keep coming home, don't they? They keep calling you on the phone. They keep sending you emails. They, they, you're, you're still mom. You're still, you're still dad. And then you become grandma and grandpa, and that role is different, and it, it, it's, it changes for you, but it's a very important role. It's a crucial role in the life of your grandchildren and in the life of your children. So I want you to take this message seriously today, too, because the message in this psalm, inside of this psalm, is important. The big idea for today is a question. It's a question I'm going to ask you over and over and over as we work our way through the text. And it is simply this. If you don't, who will? You might say, if, if we don't, who will? Or you might say, if I don't, who will? But the question is the same. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, I want to encourage you today. But I want to remind you, if you don't, nobody else will. I want to encourage you to do four things, the system inside of this text, four things that are important for us to take seriously in our role as parents and grandparents. The first one is this. We need to teach our children about God's greatness. We need to take seriously the responsibility to teach our children and our grandchildren about the greatness of of God. Maybe you're here today and you're a wannabe parent. You're not a parent yet, but you want to be a parent. If, if that's you, I want you to write this down and I want you to remember this. One of the greatest things you can do as a mom or dad when that time comes in your life is teach your kids, I mean, from the very beginning about the greatness of God. Because if you don't teach your children about God's greatness, who will? Will the school Teach your kids about the greatness of God? Will what they're watching on TV teach them about the greatness of God? Is social media going to teach them about the greatness of God? Do you think your children's friends and peers are going to teach them about the greatness of God? Are you counting on the government to teach them about the greatness of God or the political party that you belong to. Listen, one of, the, one of the great dangers that I've seen over the last five to ten years in our culture and in our country is this. Kids know more about the political party of their parent than they do about the God that their parent claims they worship because we talk more about it. We, we tell people, we tell our children, and they hear us saying it out of our mouth, we talk more about our, our political beliefs than we, we do about the God we worship. If you don't teach them about the greatness of God, who's going to do it? You think their coach is going to do it? Who's going to do it? Oh, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well, preacher's going to do it. I'm bringing them to church. I'm getting them up here for youth on Wednesday night, so the church will do it. The youth pastor will do it. Well, I can promise you we're going to do our best. But here are two realities that are going to debunk that myth that we're going to do this for you, okay? Reality number one, this is just me being honest with you. And remember, I'm a parent too, okay? Here's reality number one. That's not our job. That is not the job of the preacher. It is not the job of the youth pastor. It is not the job of the church to teach your children about the greatness of God. That is your job as a mom and a dad and a grandma and a grandpa. Ephesians chapter 4 very clearly outlines what the job of the pastor is. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And here is the purpose of them all to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Now to be sure, some of that job description, some of that uh, equipping and building up and striving for unity and striving for maturity, some of that is proclaiming and pointing out the greatness of God. But it's not the primary role 
of the minister. It's not the primary responsibility of the minister to teach your children about the greatness of God. That's reality number one. Reality number two is even more important and even more shocking. And again, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly or anything. But here's reality number two. We just don't see your kids enough to really teach them about the greatness of God. Well, let's do some math this morning. I know that's what all you woke up saying. Let's go to church and do some math. Y'all might want to get your calculators out because um, this isn't easy math. This isn't two plus two math, but I've already run the numbers. And if I did it right, these numbers will add up. Let's be very generous, okay? Let's say for, for the sake of your children, let's, let's just use very generous numbers. Let's say that from the day they're born until they leave for school, college, right? They leave your house. Let's say for 18 years, faithfully and consistently, you brought your kids to church twice a week on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings and never missed a Sunday or a Wednesday. That would mean we would touch them. They would have uh, 1,872 encounters here at church or whatever church you went to. And let's say on average, we got them one and a half hours each time you brought them. I know that's generous, but let's imagine it. You never got sick. They were never sick. You never went on vacation. They never had a sporting event or an athletic competition to attend. So every week, twice a week for 18 years, they were here 1.5 hours each time. That would mean over the course of those 18 years, we would have 2,808 hours with them. That's a lot of time, but it's really not that much in the grand scheme of things, is it? Now let's be real. That's being generous. Now let's be real. The average family in America, according to the statistics, a church, uh, attends church 22 times a year. 22 times. So let's double that. Let's say you come to church on Sunday 22 times, and you get them here on Wednesday night 22 times. That, over the course of 18 years, would be 792 church encounters in 18 years, under 800 times. Again, 1.5 hours each of those 792 times would add up to 1,188 hours we have with your students between the day they're born when they comprehend nothing to the day they leave at 18 where they still comprehend nothing. Those are the, the how much we have them, 1,188 hours. Okay, so we were extremely generous with those numbers. Now let's be extremely conservative regarding your parental numbers, okay? We were generous with the church numbers. We're going to be extremely conservative with your numbers as a parent. When you take out sleeping and working and all the other things that we do, Again, the statistics tell us on average, the average American family has about six hours a day that they're together. Now, together doesn't mean you're all sitting around the kitchen table anymore, right? Doesn't mean you're all out working in the garden together anymore, but it just means you're in the vicinity of each other. Six hours a day is, is how much you're there. But let's be conservative. Let's cut that in half and let's say you're only together as a family three hours a day. Three hours a day, 365 days a year times 18 years is 6,570 days. 6,570 days times three hours a day is 19,710 hours. So the church generously has 1,188 hours with your kids. You, very conservatively, have 19,710 hours with your children. So if your kids end up messed up, whose fault is it? That's my question. Seriously, though. If your kids don't know about God and his greatness, whose fault is it? Parents, one of our primary and most important purposes and responsibilities in life is to show our kids the greatness of God. This is where the system in Psalm 78 begins. Everything else is predicated upon and built upon this. 
He says, my people hear my instruction, listen to the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past, things we have heard and known that our ancestors passed down to us. They told them about the greatness of God. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell a future generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might, and the wondrous works he has performed. In other words, we're going to tell our kids and our grandkids and anybody who will listen about how great God is. The New International Version translated it like this, Oh, my people, hear my teaching Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. His power and the wonders he has done. Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, you need to tell your children about the great things God has done in your life. Don't keep those a secret. Don't keep them to yourself. You need to tell your kids about the great things God did in their great-grandparents' life if you know them. If you don't, make up a story. No, I'm I'm kidding. (laughs) But you need to tell them about the great things God has done in your family's life. The great things you have seen, the great things you have heard, the great things that were passed down to you. And and, and this doesn't mean you sit around the table and you you tell stories about your family all the time. It can be as simple as being out in the backyard and seeing a magnificent sunset and bringing the kids over and saying, hey, come, come look at this. Come look at what God did. Come look at what God's showing us today. Or when you see a rainbow in the sky, hey, kids, come here. Look, God's promise is in the sky for us right now. Think about the great things he's done. Talk about the great things he's done. When a prayer is answered, when you've been praying for something, don't pretend like it was just chance or luck or happenstance or don't pretend like it never happened or you never prayed for it. No, you give God the glory and the credit for it and you tell your kids, look what God did. Tell your kids about the great things God has done in your life. Tell your kids about the great things you're seeing and the great things you're learning and the great things you're feeling and the great things you're hearing. Tell your grandkids, grandma and grandpa, about the great things you have seen God do over the course of your life every chance you get. Tell your kids about the great things God has done in this church or whatever church you attend. Take every opportunity you have to just share the greatness of God and his glory with your children. Psalms 44, 1 through 3 says, God, we have heard with our ears, our ancestors have told us the work you accomplished in their days, in days long ago. In order to plant them, you displaced the nations by your hand. In order to settle them, you brought disaster on the peoples, for they did not take the land by their sword. Their arm did not bring them victory, but your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, because you were favorable toward them. They knew that because somebody told them. Parents and grandparents, it is your responsibility, our responsibility to tell our children about the greatness of God. If you don't tell them about how great he is, I can promise you this, the world will tell your kids how worthless he is. Who are they going to believe? Who are they going to hear it more from, you or the world? If you want your kids to love and to follow the Lord, You better show them and you better tell them of his greatness. Because if you don't, who will? Number two, teach your children about God's word. Don't just teach them about God's greatness. Teach them about his word. God doesn't make a suggestion that we do this, moms and dads. It's a command. This is not presented in scripture as being a good idea or an option. 
No, it's, it's a command, and this is the second part of this. Once we teach our kids about the greatness of God, then we can start to teach them about the Word of God because they have a context from which to understand it, and they have a confidence in which they can put in the Word of God because they know of God's greatness. Psalm 78, 5 through 6, he established a testimony in Jacob, and he set up a law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. It was not an option, it was not a suggestion, it was a command. So that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know they were to rise and tell their children. This command was set up not just so that the children could learn about God's law or his word. The real motivation behind it was so that the word of God would never be forgotten. He says in verse 6, so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know they were to rise and tell their children. See, we must teach them God's word and we must help them see how it applies to their life. We have to help them wrestle with the mysteries of life from the context of God's word. We have to encourage them to be in God's word daily. And listen, as I said in the beginning, Abby and I can tell you this is not easy, this is a struggle. It's a struggle in our home. Our kids, our kids don't rise early in the morning and go open their Bibles and do 50-minute quiet times with the Lord. They don't automatically turn to God's Word every time they have a problem in their life. Just last night, I was in the bedroom with one of our kids who was struggling with some stuff. She, she tends to struggle in the evenings when she's going to bed and I was just trying to remind her of God's word and God's greatness and that she can trust God, all these things, right? This isn't automatic for anybody's kids. It's not automatic for my kids. But it's why we as parents have to be consistent in this. It's why we help them and we encourage them and we're patient with them and we're consistent with them. Mom and Dad, please please hear me. The greatest legacy you can leave behind when you depart and go into eternity, the greatest inheritance you can give your children is the Word of God. It is the one thing that will never fail them, leave them. It's the one thing that can never be taken from them or stolen from them. You can leave your kids with billions of dollars, big houses and fancy cars. You you can leave your children with vast expanses of land. You can leave them with with great memories of summers at Disney World and the beach and the river. But if you have not taught them the value of the word of God, you have left them nothing. If they do not know the word of God or see its value for their lives, they are bankrupt. And the worst part is it means your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will likely not have it either. Because if you don't teach them, if you don't teach your children the Word of God, how are they going to teach their children? To the Ephesians, Paul wrote, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is important because if you don't do it, who will? We even see an example of this in Scripture. Paul mentions it in his second letter to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1, 4 through 5, he says, Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. He says, I recall your sincere faith that first lived somewhere else. It first lived in your grandmother and in your mother. And now, he says, I'm convinced is in you also. Here's a grandma and a mama who helped this young man grow up in the word of God and in the faith. And Paul saw the fruits of their labor come out in Timothy. I know you're familiar with Proverbs 22, 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Training a child in the way of God means teaching them to value and spend time in God's word. To turn to God's word when they have a problem or an issue in life. These things go hand in hand. They're not separate and apart from each other. So again, I'll ask you the simple question. If you don't do it, who will? 
Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, please take this part of your purpose as a parent and as a leader in your family seriously. It matters more than you think. Here's the next part of this system. Teach your children to trust God. When you've shown them the greatness of God and talked about that and you've exposed them to consistently the word of God, now you've put them in a position where they know God, but they still have to trust him. And what I'm about to tell you is sad but true. Kids today, by and large, is generalization, but by and large, kids today trust YouTube more than they trust God. Let me say it again. They trust YouTube more than they trust God. They trust what they see on social media more than what they see in Scripture. Your children today trust their friends more than they trust their father in heaven. And part of that is because we have not shown them God's greatness. We have not taught them God's word. And thus, they are not able to trust God or his word. They don't see their mom and dad trusting the Lord, and so why should they? Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, let me just tell you, if we don't trust God, neither will our kids. If we don't trust God with our finances, if we don't trust God with our relationships, if we don't trust God with our health, if we don't trust God with our struggles and our trials and our tribulations, why should they? You see, teaching our children to trust God means we have to trust him too. <laughs> it's, it's a simple concept, but it's so true, right? If we're going to teach our kids to trust the Lord, we have to trust him. The psalmist said it like this. Look at verse 5. He established a testimony in Jacob. He set up a law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know They were to rise and tell their children, catch this, verse 7, so that they might put their confidence in God. Let me say that again. All of this we've talked about so far is so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's work, but keep his commands. You see, the psalmist here, he's building a system by which parents can use to raise their children. Once you've taught them about God's greatness, and once you've taught them about God's word, now they have a foundation and a context. And when the rubber meets the road, when life gets hairy, when things get tough, when trials come their way, when they are given a choice as to whether they're going to trust God or not, now they have a foundation to at least possibly do so. They still have to make the choice to do it, but they've got the tools to do it. Listen, if your kids have not heard about the great things God has done, why would they trust him? If your kids have no basis or no understanding for the word of God, it's much, much more difficult for them to trust God when things get tough. But if we've done a good job as grandma and grandpa, if we've done a good job as mom and dad, and we've talked about the greatness of God, and we've exposed them consistently to the word of God, then this third one, which is so important and so critical, is possible. But if we never teach them, if we never talk about God's greatness, if we never talk about the importance of his word, if those things aren't important to us, your kids are going to find themselves in a spot where they really need to trust the Lord and they most likely just will not be able to do it. Again, we have to model it and we have to do it ourselves. What do you do when you lose your job? Do you trust God or do you fall into despair and doubt? What do you do do when your health starts to fail? Do you trust God or do do you become distraught and full of fear and anxiety? What, What do you do, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, when money's tight? When you run out of money before you run out of month? Do you lean in and trust God? Or do you whine and complain? I'm not a perfect parent. I'm not a good parent. But but I have observed this. And I do know this to be true. And I think you'll say amen to this. This is the one thing I know for sure about being a dad. Our children listen to us and our children watch us. 
And they learn how to respond to life by listening to and watching us. How you respond is how they will respond. And if we don't trust God, they won't either. The psalmist was right when he says in Psalms 9:10, those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you. That's somebody who knows the greatness of God and the word of God. He says those who know you trust in you because they know you won't abandon them. They know that you're there for all who seek you. They know, we, I mean, we know, you know God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. He doesn't abandon us. We know his name. We should trust him. Proverbs 3, verse 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding in all your ways. Know him and he will make your path straight. There's an important word in this text, a word some years ago when I was going through a very difficult and dark season in my own life, I underlined and dwelled on daily. It's not the word you might expect, but it, it's a very important word in this text. It's the word the rest of it hinges on. It's the word all. The word all. Trust the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, know him. Not some, not most, not the easy parts of your life, all. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, our kids need to see us do this. And we need to teach them to do it too. Because the result is awesome. The result of somebody who can trust God is amazing. The prophet Jeremiah tells us what the result is. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. He says this, The person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is in the Lord, is blessed. Is blessed is good enough for me, but he goes on and it gets even better. He will be like a tree planted by the water. It sends its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. That's what I want for my kids. That's what I want for myself. I want to be blessed and I want to be like a tree planted by the water. I, I... I don't want to just be blessed for me. I want to be, man, I love this last part. In a year of drought, it does not cease producing fruit. That's what I want. I want even in the the worst times of my life, I want to see God still be able to bring fruit from me. Because I know the word of God, I know the greatness of God, and that puts me in a position and a posture to trust God even in the dry season so that he can continue to grow fruit from my branches because I'm on his vine. I want to be like that tree, and I want my kids to be like that. Who wouldn't? But this isn't automatic. This this doesn't just happen without effort. It doesn't happen without trying. It, it, It doesn't happen without us being disciplined in our faith to the Lord. I want you to consider this next verse. And I want you to know the context from which it comes. This is right after Jesus predicts that Peter is going to deny him three times. It's in the middle of a very serious and intense conversation. I wish we had time to dive into all of it. But just know, like, this is serious. This is intense. He's just told Peter he's going to deny him three times. And I want you to look at what comes next in John 14, 1. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In other words, trust me. Listen, you don't want your kids walking through this life without being able to trust the Lord. And if we want them to trust God, we have to talk about God's greatness, we have to show them God's word, and then we have to model what trusting God looks like. If you don't, who will? 
Let me close with the fourth one. It's the last part of this system. And this is important. I mean, these are all important because they all work together. But this is where we really get to the pinnacle of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What it means to be a New Testament believer. And mom and dad, this is where you want your kids to wind up. They're not born this way. They, they, they don't start here. It takes a lot of work to get them here. I'm just praying we can get our four here. Okay? I'm right there with you. I know how hard this is. But listen to this last one. We must teach them to obey God. We have to teach them to obey God. We see it right here at the end of verse 7. Yeah, knowing the greatness of God is important. We can't get to obeying and trusting God without knowing God's greatness. Knowing the Word of God is crucial. And we'll never get to obeying and trusting God without knowing God's Word. Trusting God is a great step, and we've got to do that. But there are a lot of people in the world who stop here. They never go to this last step. They, they trust the Lord, but they, they don't obey the Lord. The end result is we're supposed to be obedient to our master. We're supposed to be obedient to God. If we do the other three but fall short here on this last one, what have we really accomplished? Here's what the psalmist said, so that they might put their confidence in God, they might trust him, and not forget God's work, but keep his commands. By saying keep his commands, the writer is saying the children will obey the commands that God has given them. It's so important we teach them to obey. Mom and dad, we, we, we teach them not just to obey God's word, we teach them to obey us. Your kids will learn to obey God if you teach them to obey you. If they don't obey you, why do you think they're going to obey God? The Bible says that parents play a huge part in teaching their children to obey. Children first have to learn to obey us before they will ever be able to obey God. And I know this is going to ruffle some of your feathers, but the Bible says it. Proverbs 29, 15 through 17, a rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. When the wicked increase, rebellion increases, but the righteous will see their downfall. Discipline your child, and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. There's a lot of criticism that comes with verses like these. But I believe that's because people don't really understand them, because they've been preached poorly and they've been talked about so much, but not in context. The word here for rod can actually be translated multiple ways. It can be translated club or correction. Uh, rod, as it is here, it can be translated scepter. It can be translated spear or staff even. And it is a couple of times in the Bible translated that way based on the context. You might be going, well, what's the point? Who, who cares if it's translated a lot of different ways? My point is this. The, the writer here is not talking about picking up a piece of sucker rod or rebar and just or a baseball bat and just beating the fool out of your kids. Th that's not what he's talking about at all. What the writer is saying is parents have to use an offensive tool, offensive tool, to deal with and to discipline their children. He's saying parents should never be on the defense when it comes to teaching their children to obey. They should be offensively engaged in teaching them to obey and offensively engaged in their discipline. And there's different levels of discipline and different levels of correction needed in different situations in different contexts. I get all of that. But the point is you have to be offensive, mom and dad. Because they're not going to learn it by themselves. A youth left to their own, he says, is going to be a disgrace to his mother. Because they're not going to learn it by themselves. They're not going to learn it at school. They're, they're not going to learn it from their friends. They're not going to learn it from social media. All of those places are teaching them the exact opposite. They're teaching them to say no to authority, to buck authority, to rebel against authority. Parents, you are the ones who have the role and the responsibility to be offensive in teaching your children to obey. 
I was in the store the other day. It's been a while back, but I was I was there and I'm standing, I'm standing in the checkout line, and this little kid, I mean this little monster, to be clear. I'm thinking it's four years old, maybe five, old enough to know better, throwing a fit. I mean a tantrum. Because he wanted a candy bar or a honey bun or something like that. And after his mama had told him no five times, she finally said, oh, okay, okay. She's so embarrassed. Okay, put it up here. I'll buy it for you. That's defense, not offense. Number one, mom, you should never have to say no five times. To your five-year-old or your 50-year-old. I don't care who they are. You should not have to tell them no five times. This child did not know how to obey because he had not been taught. It's not his fault. That's a failure of parental guidance. How will that child ever grow up to obey the Lord if he can't even obey his mama? Number one, you should never have to say no five times. Number two, you should never, ever have to do this next part. After she put it up there to buy it for him, she goes, now can, can mommy check out now? You should never have to ask your four-year-old for permission to do anything. Listen, I'm 43 years old, and I can honestly say that my mom and dad have never asked my permission for anything. (laughs) I was at their house not too long ago, and I got there before my dad got home from work. And so I was sitting in his chair. It's the most comfortable chair. And he came home, and do you know what he did not do? He did not say, hey, son, can daddy sit in his chair? You know what he did? He walked in. He took his cowboy hat off. He unloaded his pockets like he has for all 43 years of my life in the same little spot right there on the counter where he puts all his stuff so he can collect it tomorrow morning. And he glanced at me. (laughs) Did not say a word. Just glanced at me out the side of his face. And I got up and I went somewhere else. (laughs) I would love to tell you I did that because I respect my dad. And there's probably a little bit of that in there, but... Honestly, I did it out of instinct because I know that guy knows how to play offense. (laughs) He's really good at offense. And he's been playing offense with me for 43 years. And I just don't want to play anymore. Like, it's just better to move. (laughs) Proverbs 13, 24. The one who will not use the rod hates his son. But the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. Again, we're not talking about beating the fool out of somebody. We're talking about being offensive in our discipline. Why do we teach our children to obey us? Is it so that when we're older, they'll get up and move out of the chair we want to sit in? No. We do it so that when they get older, God can use them to expand his kingdom. So when they get older and their master in heaven calls them to do something, they obey it and they go do it. Because when they learn to obey us, they in turn learn how to obey God. And God cannot use those who live in the sin of disobedience and will not obey. It's the one person God cannot use is somebody who will not obey. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews said. Mom and dad, this is why it's important you teach your children to obey both you and the Lord. Because if they don't learn to obey you, or if they're given the option to refuse your discipline, it's going to create issues for them down the road. 
and issues for the kingdom of God. Hebrews 12, 4 through 11. He says, in struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us. And we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. But he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That peaceful fruit of righteousness is only for those who have been trained by it and know the value of discipline and know how to obey. If you don't teach them to obey, who will. As we close this morning, let me tell you about God's greatness through his word. God is so great that he has saved a sinner like me and many of the ones you're sitting around right now, to be honest. Romans chapter 3 says we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all enter into this world jacked up, messed up, fallen, wretched creatures. But it's by his grace that he came in the form of Jesus, a man. Went to a cross after living a sinless life, perfectly lived his whole life. Went to a cross, died for your sins. The sinless lamb of God died for your sins and mine so that we could be forgiven. How great is our God. The Word of God teaches us that after being buried three days, he rose again from the grave, conquering death and bringing victory not only to himself, but to each and every one of us who call him and know him as Lord. How great is our God. And if we will obey him and follow him and do what he calls us to do, the Bible says we will be blessed and we will be like that tree planted there by that water and we can bear fruit in season and out of season dry seasons and wet seasons no matter what comes our way no matter how heavy the winds get we have deep roots in the word and the ways of God deep confidence in our trust in him and a steadfast obedience to do whatever he calls us to do that my friends is my prayer for my children and yours But if we don't teach them, who will? Let's pray. If you're here today and have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or if you can hear my voice today and have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we would invite you to do that this hour. Simply say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new and whole. I thank you for your grace and for your forgiveness. Lord, I thank you for saving me and making a way for me to return to a right relationship with you. Lord, we come before you this hour and we thank you for this time we've had together in your word. And Lord, a reminder of how important it is for us to be 
biblical, godly moms and dads. We'll never be perfect moms and dads, but Lord, we can strive to be biblical, godly moms and dads. And Lord, all of our kids aren't going to grow up to be biblically godly people. They go their own ways for reasons we can't explain. But Lord, let it not be because we didn't try. Let it not be because we weren't the parents that you called us to be. Father, we pray for our children, but praying for our kids starts with praying for our parents and our grandparents. Because none of this stuff happens automatic. It, It all comes from us. So Lord, help us to be models and examples of what this is. Help us to be faithful. Help us to speak often of your greatness. Lord, help us to trust and obey. Father, help us to be in your word and to know it is true. So that our kids might as well. We love you and thank you and ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.